Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. So I'm Lucinda Bassett. Welcome, welcome, welcome to my Let Go with Lucinda. I am so excited to be here. This is the Tuesday after Mother's Day. And um, I, you know, I was thinking about the topic today and I thought, oh my God, I should talk about how to raise happy, healthy adult children. And so I didn't really call it that. I just said some tips on child rearing and because I didn't want to offend anybody who feels like maybe they did something wrong, like me. <laughs> and I have two great children, but um, I think if you're, you know, someone who has raised two children, we probably look at things that we've done and the way our children have grown and we say, I wonder if I'm the reason they're doing that. And I wonder if I caused that. I wonder if I did something wrong. There are other times we look at our children and say, oh my God, they're so amazing. Whose kid is that? Or, oh my God, that's my kid. And uh, hopefully he or she learned that from me. And then there are other times we look at our kid and go, oh my God, whose kid is that? <laughs> you know, um, A lot of mothers blame the fathers and a lot of fathers blame the mothers for the good and the bad stuff. Uh, but I wanted to just spend some time tonight talking about how amazing it is at all, if you are a mother, that you were fortunate enough to be a mother, um, whether you have adopted children or you gave birth to children. And if you, and obviously you got here from somebody, so you are the child of someone. So if you're fortunate enough to have a mother in your life that you love and care for and spent time with on Sunday, well, bless your heart, because probably Mother's Day is the most important day um, of the year to most mothers, okay? Uh, and you say, no, no, it's her birthday. No, 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 it's not. It's Mother's Day because uh, if there's one thing that all of us want to do as parents is we want to think that's the one thing we did right or the five things we did right if you have five children. Um, but the truth of the matter is what matters to every parent um, more than anything, even the not so good parents, is uh, what their parents think of them and if they did a good job as uh, parents. And one of the things that reinforces that we did is when you show up on Mother's Day, <laughs> yes, with flowers and balloons and take us to lunch or dinner or cook for us. And uh, when you don't, it's extremely painful. And that brings me to the uh, topic of abandoned mothers. And what's really interesting is 20, 27% of Americans have cut contact with at least one parent. In other words, they are estranged from their mother or their father. And, and what's really odd about that is a lot of them, you know, come from parents who thought that they did a really great job. They come from a father or a mother that would tell you, hey, I was there for them. You know, I, I helped them do their homework. I was there every night. I cooked dinner for them. I was the Cub Scout leader. I was the school mom. I went on the field trips. I you know, did everything. And yet my daughter or my son has chosen to become estranged. And, and it's extremely um, powerful, hurtful, and complicated. And there's a lot of things we could go into, but I'm not, that, that'll be another night. Okay. Um, and, and so when you're out there on Mother's Day, sitting in a restaurant with your balloons and your cards and your three children and your grandchildren or whatever, and your loving husband and everybody's happy, know that your friend down the street may not be having that experience. Know that your sister may not be having that experience. Know that your best friend may not even be hearing from her only daughter. And, and it's extremely painful. And it, it turns that day into the worst day of the year. So if you're someone who's estranged from your mom, I beg you <laughs> to think about that because you know if she passed away tomorrow and you never got to say, I love you, or thank you for something. Maybe, maybe you would regret it. Um, maybe not. And then I want to talk now, though, about the importance of of raising children. I I recently had another grandchild. Uh, my daughter Brittany had a little girl named Everest, and she's now two months old. The most beautiful little thing in the whole wide world. And uh, I sit in awe as I watch my daughter as a mother. And she is an amazing mother. She is, first of all, everything's organic and she cooks everything for her kids. And uh, she, you know, breastfeeds and she works full time. And she, uh, she has a 20 month old little boy named Fox, who is the kindest, most gentle little boy. And I'm going to tell you right now, 
he's that way because of the way he was raised. And so it's really made me in awe of her as a mother. And I'd like to take credit for that, but you know, I wasn't as good a mother as she is. And none of us were probably as good as our kids because the hopefully the next generation does a better job, right? But I think times have changed. We're more informed. My, my particular daughter is very, very informed in what she doesn't know. She goes on the internet and finds out. And she's very, very, very conscientious about herself as a mother and what, how she handles her son. And so what that made me think about is, oh my God, do we even realize what an incredible responsibility it is when we are given a little human, you know, fresh out of the womb, whether it's yours or someone else's, whether it's adopted or you gave birth to this child, think about how profound it is that God, the universe, whatever, hands you this fragile little tiny life. And from the very beginning of its significance and its birth, it's looking at you and you're touching that baby and everything you do and everything you say and the look in your, on your face, that is going to determine who that baby becomes as a one-year-old, as a two-year-old, as a five-year-old, and as a 20-year-old. And it is an incredible responsibility. He or she will take every moment that you spend with them, all of your energy, the things you say, how you look at them, how you judge them. And as they grow, that's going to be their foundation for determining who they are. And, and I, I want to say something too here that some of us have raised kids who end up, you know, addicts or end up, you know, suicidal or end up with problems, you know, bigger than us. And we try to help them and can't. And, and, and I still, I, I'm here to tell you that happens with the best of parents. And I think that is the, the strange dynamic that happens when a child grows up in a really stable, loving family and ends up really unstable or messed up. And I know people, you know, that, that that is the experience they've had. And you scratch your head and you say, what did I do wrong? And you, maybe you did nothing wrong. Maybe there's something genetically that that child was born with, a predisposition for addiction, alcoholism, some type of depression, who knows? And that's not your problem or fault. And maybe you spent a lifetime trying to help that person and, and to no avail. And we've all heard of particular people who that have happened to, and that's tough. Um, and so what I want to talk about is looking at little tiny babies and children in 2022. What can we do to raise them in a way that they end up being, I want to say, healthy, happy adults? And listen, you can't always, you can do everything right and they still end up unhappy, unhealthy adults. I grew up in a really dysfunctional family with a neurotic mom who was a warrior and a fa father who was an aggressive, abusive, verbally abusive, violent alcoholic. And I still turned out okay. I mean, it's questionable, but I think I turned out okay. No, I mean, I turned out to be someone who could help people all over the world overcome anxiety and depression, partially became because I went through anxiety and depression as a child, because I came from such a broken, dysfunctional family. So I think the other interesting thing to me is that when I sit and I look at Fox, who's now two years old, and he's, he's gracious, and he's kind, he's not mean, he goes, it doesn't go mine. And he doesn't, he's not mean to people. And he's not an aggressive little boy. And I think, oh, my God, if I could do it over, and I want you to ask yourself this. Maybe you have a five-year-old. Maybe you have a 25-year-old. But if you could do it over and you could rethink your parenting, what would you do differently? There are so many things I would do differently. First of all, um, I would talk to them differently. I, I see my, and these are just some tips I'm going to give you as we move along here. I've done my homework as I usually do. But just in observing my own special little grandson, you know, my daughter talks to him like an adult. She never goes, oh. She, she says, Fox, Fox, come over here and sit down. You're not allowed to get up and run around at dinner. I mean, she talks to him like he's 20. And therefore, he responds, you know, in a much more mature way. It's really interesting. 
I would try to stay calm no matter what. I tend to be an overreactor and I would be like, ah, you know, something happened. And she doesn't do that. She stays really, really calm and handles things really calmly. So he tends to calm down more quickly. Um, I would really encourage my children to be kind all the time and considerate of others. And I would, um, you know, what's interesting, I wouldn't care if they hung out with the popular kids in school. I wouldn't care if they were liked so much or if I was liked by the most popular family. I think I did that a little bit when my kids were growing up. I was in a very competitive area and I think I wanted to hang out with the fun people. So I wanted them to like my child. So I tried to make him or her fit in. I would never do that again. I would want them to be who they are. And if people didn't like them or if they weren't popular because they weren't behaving in a certain way, if it's a way that I don't care for, I would encourage them to hang out with somebody else. It's not about being popular. The other thing, I, I think I would really be careful about labeling your child. If the school wants to say your child has ADHD or, you know, even autism, that there's so many quick to label schools and, and professionals and teachers, and then your, then your child lives with the label. So, I, I mean, there are certain situations if your child's got diabetes or certain disorders that may need to be treated, then you need to let them understand that they have something that needs, you know, medication that needs to be helped. But I think you got to be very careful about these, you know, uh, labeling of behavioral disorders. Um, I would let my, my kids fail more. I would let them fail a test. I would let, I mean, I, I don't want them to, and I had tutors and we did homework and I tried to help them be good students. But the truth of the matter is I'd let them fail and see how it feels to fail. And, if it means failing a grade because they just didn't try. It's one thing that they really have a terrible disability. And that's where you've got to know where to draw the line. But that's what good schools are for. And that's what you're for. Um, I would also not defend them for every little thing. I would let them defend themselves. I would ask them more questions and I wouldn't have all the answers. Um, I would ask a lot more questions and give a lot less instru instruction. <clears throat> also, um, I would teach them, and this is really important to me now, I would teach them about spirituality. If you're Christian, teach them about God and, and Jesus Christ, if that's what you believe. If you're Jewish, teach them about Judaism. If, teach them about spirituality. Teach them that there's a higher power. Take them to church on Sunday. Give them something to believe in, to be accountable to that's bigger than them. I see that in really healthy families. They turn to God. And, um, and sometimes you have kids that don't want to go to church, go anyway, you know, don't let the kid run the roost, you run the roost, don't let them tell you what they're going to do, you tell them what they're going to do, kids need to know that you're in control and that you hold the power. Um, I would choose my children's friends more carefully, you know, I tend to tend to let my kids choose their friends. And again, I got a little caught up in wanting them to be popular and liked. And I wanted to hang out with their friends, parents, and I would never do that again. Thank God I'm in my 60s, I don't really care what you think of me. I don't care if you don't like me. I don't need to be liked. I just need to be loved by people that know me and let me be me. And that's what I would be teaching my children. The other thing I think that's so important that I've realized now is I would really, really, really watch my children very, very carefully at every single age, at five, at three. Uh, I did anyway, but at 12, at 15, I'd want to know what they were doing. I would be going through their room to see if there's any paraphernalia in there. I would not allow them to smoke weed. I would not allow them to experience, experience uh, experiments. Sorry. I would not allow them to experiment with weed and alcohol at 15, I would be very strict. And that's one of the mistakes I think I made. You know, I, I was seeing someone at the time to try to get my kids through losing their father. And, um, and I was told, choose your battles. Well, I chose, I should have chose more battles, to be honest with you. I should have went through every drawer and I should have looked through every bag and I should have said, you're not doing that. You're not hanging out with them. What is this right here? And I didn't do it as much as I should have. And, and I regret that. Um, the other thing I would do is I would say no all the time. I didn't say no enough. I, you know, you want to do this? Yes, I really want you to do that. You want to do this? Do this. You want to do that? Let's do that. You need a new outfit? Let's go buy you a new outfit. 
you need, you know, I was guilty of buying both of my children um, a car when they turned 16. That is the most ridiculous, stupid thing I could have done. I bought them each a brand new car. And listen, I wasn't rich by any means. I mean, I did okay, but I don't know, in some stupid way, I thought one of them deserved it. And I thought the other one would behave better if I bought them a car. It doesn't work. It's a bad idea. It's the wrong message. They should buy their own car. I'm just telling you, if I could go back and do it again, these are the things I would have done differently. Um, I, I think that the other thing that, that I, I really did, but I would still get, encourage you to do is family dinners every night. And you say, oh, you know, we'll just go eat out. No, I'd rather see you sit there and make spaghetti and pour a can of sauce into the thing and maybe throw some tomatoes in it ground some ground beef. It'd be nice if it's all organic, but just have the house smell like somebody cares enough to cook. And every night you set the table and you sit down and with it and they're going to go, I don't want to do this. I want to go over to Susan's. No, you're going to sit down and we're going to have family dinner every single night. And it would be a really good idea. And I, again, it doesn't have to be, you know, everything's perfect. In fact, let them set the table and let them help you cook. Give them responsibilities at home. Let them make their bed before they leave every day. Make them make their bed before they leave every day. And never just give them money. Make them earn whatever you give them. And never, ever, ever let them talk back to you. Never. If they talk back to you, you don't let them talk to you. And this is just the way that kids should be raised. And I think so many of us didn't do it. And I have friends who did do it. And their kids have turned out pretty incredible and don't disrespect them. And their kids are very responsible adults. And I think a lot of it is because they've raised their kids responsibly. Okay. And they didn't let their kids get away with things that I probably let some of mine get away with. Um, so if you've raised your kids and they're now adults, you know, um, you might be saying, gosh, now what is it too late? No, we're going to talk at the end about what you can do to, to help your adult child become a healthy adult child. Um, exactly. Um, you know, here's the thing. If you, if, you want to, if you want to give me a message, you can, you can uh, email me in the chat room on the screen. But the problem is, I think a lot of us at my age, a lot of us did this. I'm not, I was more guilty of it than others probably. And I think a lot of it depends on where you live. I raised my kids in Los Angeles. And so that's different than raising them in Ohio, I think. I think, you know, they're exposed to more. I think there's more, there's more materialism out, out in LA. I think that as a parent, you tend to be pulled into that. And I think when you live in the Midwest, maybe it's it's more, it's more grounded. So, you know, there's a lot to talk about and a lot to think about, but researchers have given us more unfortunately, alarming statistics on an acute and consistent increase in child emotional and mental issues. In fact, it's re reaching epidemic proportions. Um, one in five children have mental health issues. This is just unbelievable. And I think this is low. 43% um, increase was observed in ADHD. And I think that's low. I think that's the first pe thing ch uh, people go to now is Oh, he's or she, especially boys, have ADHD. Let's put them on some meds. And you got to be really careful with those meds. You put a little boy on meds for ADHD, they could end up as an adult with issues. And this is if you give them a lot of it over a period of time. But, you know, you got to be really careful with those meds. I would never give kids meds for ADHD in the times we live in now. We know too much about it. It's just not a good idea. Um, increase of 37% in teenage depression and anxiety. I personally know it's much higher than that. In fact, the number one problem with kids today is anxiety and depression combined. And the problem with anxiety and depression in children is they don't know what it is and it scares them because it manifests as scary thoughts and then they're afraid to tell anybody. So then they think they're crazy. So they might turn to weed, they might turn to other, other drugs, they might turn to alcohol. And before you know it, you have an addicted little 18 year old. Um, and that's 
much harder to deal with than anxiety and depression, okay? There's a 200% increase, are you ready for this? You're not gonna believe it, in, su in the suicide rate among, among teenagers today. And you're going, oh my God. Um, and some of this, of course, is related to COVID. Um, the last two years have been very, very difficult on kids and teenagers. As you all know, a lot of them had to stay at home. They were socially inactive. They were not among their peers at school. Uh, it was hard enough on us as adults. You can only imagine how hard it would be on a 10-year-old or 14-year-old. But it's really about what's happening environmentally today. Kids these days are overstimulated. Uh, there's too much materialism. They are digitally distracted. By that I mean, and you know what I mean. How many times do you see, you sit at a restaurant and you see people's kids on a, on a phone? They're over there playing and you think, oh, that's bad. They're on their phone texting their friends. No, they're not. They're pay, playing some stupid game. And you look over at their dads and they're on their phones playing a stupid game too. And they, you know, and or worse yet, they're on their iPad playing a stupid game or watching a stupid show. I can't tell you how annoying it is when you sit at a dinner table and the people beside you have their eight-year-old on, on their iPad playing some stupid game and you hear the music on the iPad. I want to turn over there and say, what are you doing to your kid? What are you thinking? So parents, um, think about the digital distraction that your kids are being consumed by, or they're sitting on their computers at home at night. Do you even know what they're doing or what they're watching or who they're talking to or what they're doing on Instagram and Facebook. I'm sorry, it's spitting all over myself. <laughs> Kids are getting, I'm, I'm just so passionate about this. Kids are getting into so much trouble in social media today. And on social media, you should be monitoring who they're talking to, what they're doing, who they're on Facebook with, if they're even allowed to be on Facebook. You should be monitoring how much time they have on the phone, how much time they have in social media. And ex go in, get on their computer. They shouldn't have a password that you can't access. They shouldn't have a computer if you can't go in and look at it. And they shouldn't have a phone that you don't have the password to. And if they do, take it away from them. You're paying for it. And you're going, oh, my God, I can't believe you're saying all this. Listen to me before it's too late. The last few, few years, kids have been filled with digital distractions, and they're getting things without earning them, like cars and money and clothes so they can keep up with their friends. Um, they have a sedentary lifetime, lifestyle because they sit at home and watch TV and instead of getting out and being physical and they have instant uh, gratification, which is, you know, they need it, they want it, they get it. And they don't have boring moments anymore. Do you guys that are my age remember when we used to actually get bored? Ah, I don't know what happened. I don't know how I lost you. Am I still there? Somebody tell me. Ah, am I still there? Type in Frank. Am I still on? Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I lost you there. So the thing is, our kids don't have time to have boring moments. And boring moments are so important, not even for kids, but for us. It's like when you sit there and you're bored. You know, instead of pulling out the, the beer or the glass of wine and turning on that stupid television set, I read the most in interesting article about, you know, people who watch a lot of TV are, are just trying to stimulate themselves so that they don't have to sit and think about maybe why they're unhappy or why they are lonely or why they are sad. Instead, turn the TV off and take a walk and call a friend and take a bike ride and or sit and have a boring moment out in your own backyard and learn something about yourself. But kids need boring moments too. If we want our kids to be happy, healthy individuals, we need to get back and wake up and get back to the basics, I guess I would say. Set boundaries and remember that you are the captain of your ship. You are the captain of your household. I have a client right now, Frank, I know he's on here and I'm so proud of him. Um, He's got two boys and he's a single dad and 
he's <laughs> really on it with them, you know, checking out what they're doing and making sure they're doing their homework and making sure he's getting his driver's license and comes home every night and is about the kids and making something, something, smoking something on the grill and, you know, and, and it's a lot, but he's doing it. So set boundaries. Remember that you're the captain of your ship. Your children will feel safer and more grounded knowing that you are the president, that you are the government, that you care, that you're watching, that you're in control. Offer children a balanced lifestyle filled with what they need, not just with what they want. Tell them, hey, you know what? We're going to go for a hike this weekend. We're going to go out. We're going to hike for three miles or we're going to go for a bike ride. We're going to do something that's good for us as a family. And they might go, I don't want to do it. You don't care. We're going to go out, get on bikes, and then we're going to come home and we're going to make chicken together. We're going to barbecue chicken. Offer children a balanced lifestyle, not just what they want. And don't be afraid to say no if what they want isn't what they should have. And something else that's so important these days, and there's no excuse for not doing it, is a balanced, healthy, nutritious diet. Don't let your kids sit and eat, you know, potato chips and drink Pepsi and eat junk food. There's no excuse for it anymore, you know? Show your kids how to cook healthy food. It's so easy to buy organic vegetables. And my daughter has taught me this and, and bake them in the oven with a little bit of olive oil and throw some organic chicken in there and pour some tomato sauce over it. My daughter throws dinner together in 20 minutes and it's always organic and it's always healthy. I didn't do the same thing. I never bought organic and I made macaroni and cheese as we all did out of the box. <laughs> you know. And I could never do that with my grandson. My daughter would kill me. But you don't have to because now you can buy organic macaroni and cheese. But the point is, show your children how to eat healthy now. So when they're adults, they eat healthy. If you're going through McDonald's and buying them a burger and feeding them fattening foods and letting them eat sweet cereal for breakfast, they're going to grow up eating fattening unhealthy food. So nutritious food and don't, you know, I would say limit junk food if you give them any at all. Um, and, and when I said spend one hour a day doing out, outdoor activities with your kids, bicycling, fishing, um, anything you can think of, you know, that they enjoy. Um, the other thing, and this is really something that we didn't do a lot of, my husband was better at it than me, but don't, don't overlook table, board, table games, board games. Um, there are so many great board games and card games and kids love to sit and play Monopoly or Yahtzee, or Life, or, you know, any, any games that your kids can think of, that you can think of, um, you know, games are really good for the family. They bring you together. Um, involve your children in all of your tasks. So, you know, on the weekends, if you're cleaning the house at night after dinner, help them, have them clean up the table, have one of them put the dishes in the dishwasher, have the other one clean up the table before they do homework. They should always have tasks. They should always help you with the work around the house. Help them, have them help you wash the car. Have them help you mow the yard. And even if you've got housekeepers, my, my kids did not grow up with housekeepers most of their life. But, you know, I, I didn't necessarily make them do the work. I did it all. Help, have them help you do the laundry and fold the laundry. How else are they going to learn? Um, implement a consistent sleep routine for your child. And this is so important, too, and you need to start right away. And I've seen my daughter do this where her little boy was on a, a sleep um, um, pattern and routine very, very early. She's already got her two month old sleeping through the night. It's not always easy to do, but it's worth it because they love the consistency too. read them a book at night, say a prayer at night. I, I, I'm telling you, don't underestimate the power of prayer, prayer before dinner, prayer before you go to bed at night, you know prayer. They could say a little prayer when they get up. Don't underestimate the power of teaching your kids how to meditate, how to do some breath work. Kids really love breath work. So sit with them and show them how to breathe. And I really believe in giving your kids positive um, intentions. Maybe you could write three intentions with your child every day. You know, today I'm going to be kind. Today I'm going to be happy. Today, I'm going to make someone smile. And okay, I want you to take this to school in your head or even put it in your child's lunchbox so they read it. Or you put intentions in their lunchbox. You are an amazing little girl. 
I love you so much. You have the most beautiful smile. Um, and put that in your kid's lunchbox. Teach them the importance of being respectful and kind to themselves every day and to be respectful and kind to each other. Um, teach responsibility and independence to your children. And, and I'm, I'm just giving you some things here to teach to any age child. Um, teach them, don't overprotect them. You know, if they're having a hard time with someone at school, ask them questions. What do you think is going on? Why do you think she's saying those things to you? How do you think you could handle this? And let them figure it out. I mean, obviously, if someone's physically beating them, you're not going to tolerate that. But let your kids figure out their own issues and talk them through it and ask them questions so that they become good problem solvers. If you're constantly running to try and fix everything for them, how are they going to learn to fix everything for themselves? Um, don't, don't, don't always load up their bad pack, backpacks. Don't carry their backpacks for them. Don't take them their lunch if they forgot it. Don't take them their math book if they forgot it. Don't peel their bananas for them or peel their pre-peel their oranges. Let them do it. <laughs> and you're like, oh my God, this sounds really tough. And I'm talking about like five and above, you know? It's called delayed gratification. It's called taking, called taking responsibility for themselves. It, this is really important, you guys. And I didn't do it right, okay? Um, I just, I, I wanted my kids to feel loved. I wanted them to feel that, they could get what they needed. I wanted them to, I overpacked. I gave them the best lunches. I peeled everything, you know, and uh, I don't know, I guess, you know, I, I felt like I wanted them to know I loved them, but it was probably the worst thing I could have done. Provide opportunities for kids to, uh, this delayed gratification thing is so important. That was one of my worst mistakes, probably with probably my younger child. It's like, you, you know, I, I would say, oh, well, maybe if I gave him what he wanted, he would behave more, you know, appropriately. When in reality, delayed gratification is such an important lesson for all of us, right? You don't always get what you want right away. You may not get it till you're 30, 40, or 50. I don't know about you, but that's happened for me. And I've had to learn to be patient. I've, I've had to learn to sit and wait. And patience is such a virtue. Virtue. And you have to teach your kids when they're sitting over there. And I, I go back to my, my grandson. He'll sit at a table and he'll start to have a meltdown because he wants his food now. And my daughter will say, when you're eating out, you need to sit here calmly and behave. And you have to wait for your food. Does it always work? No. Sometimes he'll melt down but he'll, and he'll look at her and she'll just keep talking to me and act like she, and he calms down, you know, and you, that, that meltdown and that I want it and I want it now. If you give it to him now. When they're 25, they're going to want it. And they're going to want it now. So um, delayed gratification. Don't use technology as a substitute for your time. You may be really busy and overwhelmed. Don't go in and set them down in front of one of these stupid cartoons right now with the really big bulging eyes. Say, sit there for an hour. Don't turn around and hand their laptop. Say, sit and play on your laptop for two hours. I've seen some pretty sad experiences where parents are sitting on the phone talking to their friend and their kids on the sofa on the on their little laptop for two hours. It's disgusting. Okay. Hey, they, they can be on the laptop, but maybe it's maybe it's 15 minutes a day. Maybe it's every other day for a half an hour. I don't know, but you you know, and, and if you know a good rule of thumb is if you think they're probably getting too much laptop time, too much phone time, they probably are. If you're suspicious that your kid might be smoking weed. He probably is. If you're suspicious that your kid's drinking too much, they probably are. Um, so be available. Be emotionally available. Be available. Be tuned in to what your kids are going through. If you think there's a problem, there probably is. If you think they're anxious, they probably are. And then sit and talk to them. Ask them what they're feeling. Ask them what it feels like. Ask them what they're afraid of. Ask them what their body is feeling. It's okay to feel anxious. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel worried about that test tomorrow. You come and talk to me about it. Do you want to sit down and go over the, you know, the answers tonight? I'll do that with you. And go to bed at night and teach them the importance of letting go and giving it up to God. There's something to be said to everybody 
for having that higher power to let go and let God, let go, give it to the universe, whatever you need to say and teach your child that there's a place to let it go and someone else will look out for you. And that's a really safe place to land for a child. Um, in fact, I would highly recommend that at night before bed, turn the phones off, turn the computers off, turn the TV off, no digital distractions. Become an emotional regulator for your child. Teach them how to recognize and handle their own frustration, their own anxiety, their own fear. Teach them by example how you handle yours. If they see mommy running off and grabbing a wine and screaming, then, you know, they're going to do the same. And, I, and, and, and that's not what you want to teach them. And believe me, this isn't easy when you have a child who has issues anyway. You may have a child who's born with a predisposition toward, you know, um, autism or, um, you know, there's so many Asperger's. I mean, there's so many labels now. OCD. Um, there's so many labels. I'm never going to go start giving you ideas. But if you have a kid that has issues, they're going to be even harder to stay calm with because they can drive you crazy. But if you could just take yourself out of it and show them now, now we have more skills. If you could show them how to meditate, if you could show them how to pray, if you could show them how to breathe instead of, you know, um, acting out, if you could show your kids, okay, obviously you're feeling frustrated right now. Obviously you're having a hard time calming down. Come and sit with me and put on some of that fabulous Jennifer Brazen radio and let mommy show you this breathing. Let me show you how to calm down. Can you breathe for me? Come on, let's breathe together. Hold their hand and talk to them about chakras. Just explain to the, them that, you know, this is a porthole for connecting with, with your spiritual self. This is your heart energy right here. You can actually talk to God here, you know, this, your solar plexus down here. This is your voice that tells you when you did something wrong or when you hurt somebody's feelings and you can talk to that voice and say, tell me what to say to her so that I can let her know I'm sorry. Tell me what I did wrong. You can talk to your heart voice and say, how can I let mommy know I love her? Or how can I let Susie know I'm sorry? Or how can I go to daddy and say, I'm sorry. You can teach your kids so much about what you've already learned on these Zoom calls. Go back and look at your notes or call me and let me help you. But the bottom line is show your kids how to have healthy emotions, how to handle their frustrations, their anger and their anxiety. Show them how to say thank you. Show them how to greet. Show them how to take turns. Show them how to share. These are all really important guidelines for your children. How do you do that? You say thank you, you greet people, you say hello, you share with other people. I remember when Sammy was little, David would take Sammy to a sushi restaurant in the town that we lived in and they'd be out there unloading trucks and David would say, come on, Sammy, we're gonna help them unload the trucks. And you know, we took our kids and th on Thanksgiving and did, went to the place where you could deliver turkeys and you know, pack the packages up and you know, all those things. Um, but your kids are watching you connect to people with a smile, connect to them. Don't be afraid to hug your kids, to hold your kids, to smile at your children, to tell them they're beautiful. When they go off in the morning, tell them, oh my God, do you know how much I love you? Do you know how proud of you I am? Do you know how beautiful you look today? Because when they hear you doing that, it reflects back to them and they may go off to school and say to their little friend, I really like your dress. You know, I really like you know, the shoes you're wearing today, or, you know, Miss Langston, I just really appreciate you as my teacher. And that's the other thing, show them how to, how to give people gifts, give them a gift or flowers to take to their teacher for the day to let them know how much they appreciate someone. So your kids learn by watching you. And it goes back to Mother's Day. Um, your kids are watching you and how you treat your mother. And that's how they're gonna treat you. And you can always tell what kind of husband a man's gonna be by how he treats his mother. And my fiance is the most amazing man. I've talked about him many, many times, but he talks to his mother two or three times a day. He adores her. She's 86 years old. She's such a cool mom. And you know he speaks so highly of her. He has pictures of her. 
he just took her back to Mexico to this house they've had, for, this little old house they've had for 50 years, flew her back there, flew back with her. Um, so your kids are watching how you treat your mother. If you have an estranged relationship with your mother, you may want to rethink that if you have children, because you're showing them by example how to be a good mother to your mother. So what do you do with your adult children to help turn them into healthy, happy adult children? Well, first of all, get to know them as adults, because now if they're adults, and I'm, I'm saying 18 and over, although I think there's still so much, don't, don't think for one moment that you should not be watching your 18 year old, um, you know, through uh, focused eyes and, and through the back of your head, because I think when your kids are 22, 23, 25, and they're actually adults, um, then you need to see who are they as adults? Let them show you who they are. Stop trying to mold them into somebody when they're 23, 25 that you want them to be. Um, and if they are living out on their own and they're 25 years old, respect their privacy, call them before you go over there, let them know that you're coming, ask them if they want you to come and visit them, respect their privacy when you call them, when they say, hey, I'm, I'm busy right now, can I call you later? Don't get your feelings hurt. Know that, you know, they'll call you later. Um, if you feel that they're angry with you about something, ask them, hey, are you upset with me about something? Ask more questions and try to talk less and try to get to the bottom of whatever it is that they're upset with you for. Um, don't bug them about what they're doing. Why aren't you married yet? Why don't you have children? Why aren't you in a relationship? Why don't you have an important career? Um, you know, if they want to talk to you about it, they will. Now, if you think there's something you can do to help guide your children at 23 and 25, and they ask them if they want your help, ask them if they want your thoughts. Um, I would strongly suggest you don't loan your kids money. And if you do, make them pay you back. If they're 25 or they're 30, if they, and if you want to give them money as a gift, because maybe they've worked really, really hard and you want to help them in some way, you want to gift them money, that's fine. But if you loan them money, make them pay it back. And it's, it's advised you make them pay it, pay them back, pay it back with interest. And you should even do a contract. Why? Because you're trying to teach your kids how to be responsible adults. Um, let them clean up after themselves. You know, if your 23-year-old comes over for dinner, don't clean everything up and do the dishes. Get over here. Help me clean up. You clean up. You do the dishes. If they're living with you, make them clean up their room. Make them help you clean the house. Don't let them be pigs. And why are they living with you at 25 years old? I think by 25, they should be out on their own. But that's a decision you make with your adult child. Um, don't make them ever choose between you and their family. And in that same way, don't make them choose between you and a partner. And you may, they may be with a partner that you don't care for, but they have a right to choose their partner. They have a right to choose their sexuality and they have a right to choose what they do for a living. And you have a right to say, hey, you know what? Um, I, I'm not really crazy about what you're doing and I'm not really crazy about your partner, but I'm gonna do my best to participate in your life. That said, if you feel like your adult children is being abusive to you, or if you feel like your adult children is doing things you don't approve of, you have every right to step away. So these are decisions you have to make because your adult child, by the time they're 25, they're pretty much who they're going to be. Um, I think it's also really important with your adult children to talk about um, your life, how you want to live your life uh, as a parent, as, you know, Maybe they want to move away and that's going to hurt you. Maybe they want to take their, your grandchildren and move to another part of the country. You have to let them. It's their life. It's their adventure. And if you want to follow them, great. And if you don't, then don't. Um, but you have to sit as two adults. And if your kids want to go off and move away and move out of the country, you've got to let them be and let them explore their own life. And it's also important to have an honest discussion about your life as you age, how you wanna spend your life as you age, you as, as the parent, whether you're a single parent or you have a partner, how you wanna spend your life um, as you age in your life. And you should never, never criticize your adult children's parenting if they're parents, because you know what? They've gotta figure it all out for themselves. So the bottom line is, I have notes here as I always do. Mm. In summary, 
if you want to raise happy, healthy children. I'm just going to do a brief overview. You might want to write it down. Be happy yourself. Let's start there. You know, be a happy parent because your kids see by what you do and, and learn by what you do, not what you say. So if you want to be, uh, if you want to raise happy, gracious, polite, kind children, you need to be a happy, gracious, polite, kind person. Teach them to build healthy relationships by them observing you having healthy relationships with your girlfriend, with your partner, with your, um, with your fiance, with your friends. Um, expect um, your kids to be the best version of themselves, but they've got to see you being the best version of yourself. If your kids need to learn how to handle anger and depression, they need to see how you handle your anger and depression. Teach your children to be optimistic people, to see that the glass is half full, that you're looking forward to the holidays, you're looking forward to life. Um, teach them emotional intelligence, teach them how to manage you know, difficult people, how to manage um, impatience, how to manage um, delayed gratification, Teach them how to work really, really hard for your money, how to save money, um, how to earn things like a nice car and a nice home. Um, teach them self-discipline. You know, that's when you keep your house clean and you put things away and you take care of your animals and you take care of your parents. Um, teach them healthy playtime and do that with them. Show them that, hey, mom's going to the gym. Mom's on the treadmill. Mom's on her bicycle. Mom's taking the dogs for a walk. Um, you know, show them that you've rigged your environment for to, to have a happy place. When they come to your home, there are flowers out and things are clean and there's good energy. And maybe you have a room for them at your home. I, I personally think that's important that you have a space for them with their pictures and their things. And, you know, I have that and my kids are 35 and 30. Maybe you don't have space for it. Maybe you just have one room where all the kids come. But I do think that having their pictures up and having a place if you have grandchildren where there are grandchildren toys and a, maybe a room for your children when they come to visit. I, I think that's important. And I go back to have them for dinner, maybe one night a month where you invite the kids and all the kids to come and maybe you cook or maybe you all cook together. So you keep that family dinner thing going. Okay. Well, that's my advice, um, how to raise happy, healthy children. And it's such an important, I think, topic. And, um, and you would say, well, are yours perfect? And I would say, absolutely not, <laughs> just so we're clear. Okay, but uh, they're still around and I think they still love me. And, uh, and I have two really great grandchildren that I will tell you, it's everything people say it is. Uh, my grandchildren give me so much happiness. So I hope that you can share some of these ideas with your children and we're going to breathe. So I encourage you to get yourself in a comfortable position right now. And I'm gonna find one of my favorite breath work songs. And unfortunately, this is where I'm gonna end the, po end the podcast. So I wanna take a moment and say, I'm Lucinda Bassett. And um, I hope you'll follow me on my podcast, Let Go With Lucinda. And I hope you will follow me on Instagram and Facebook. And um, I'm trying to find my, got to get myself off airplane mode here. And I hope you will um, call me for free coaching. I Free coaching. Ha, you wish it was free. <laughs> call me for coaching. You can have a free call with me for 10 minutes to determine if my coaching is for you. All you've got to do is call Darla at 419-350-7499. And Darla can set you up with a free 10 minute call with me. I do life coaching. I do coaching for everything from raising children to dealing with, um, you know, deaths in the family to anxiety and depression and success. So, you know, just feel free to call Darla to set a free, uh, set up a free 10 minute call with me and follow me on Facebook and Instagram and my podcast on every podcast uh, platform, Let Go With Lucinda. And also if you've missed any of these Zoom calls, you can go to YouTube. It's my pleasure to show up on Tuesday nights with you guys. I hope you learned something from this session tonight. And I will see you all two weeks from now. 
and we'll have another fabulous topic to talk about. So meanwhile, peace, take care of your own.